Welcome to another interview for Millionaires Magazine and the Millionaires Movement. I'm Amanda Jane Clarkson, editor in chief, and today I'm delighted to be joined by the very inspiring Alana Pratt. Alana is an intimacy expert, certified coach, author, host, global media personality, and go to authority for those who have suffered heartbreak, are ready to live unapologetically and an attract and attract an open-hearted ideal relationship. Her vulnerability and courage landed her a featured weekly column on the Good Men Project, featured as an icon of influence and as guest expert on Huffington Post, People Magazine, Forbes, CBS, and Fox and The Jenny McCarthy Show. She is the author of four books, has interviewed Whoopi Goldberg and Alanis Morissette, and hosts the edgy podcast, Intimate Conversations, where listeners learn how to find the relationship they deserve. Wow, welcome Alana. We can't wait for you to share your wisdom with our millionaire followers. It is fabulous to have you. I was gonna say on our show, but it's in our magazine. <laughs> But that's okay. I love it. I love it all. And thanks for having me. <laughs> so Alana, share with us your story of how, well, where your journey began to how you got to where you are today. Yes. Well, we, we need a bottle of wine in about three hours. For me okay, to girlfriend, I'll let that happen right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm a small town Canadian girl. And I knew I didn't fit in where I grew up. I knew there was something else I was supposed to do. So Uncle Phil drove a big 18-wheeler semi down to LA once a month. And so I quit college and I didn't take over my dad's pharmacy, Pratt's pharmacy. I hopped on the semi to make it in Hollywood. And I was talented enough, but I didn't have a visa. So then I went over to Japan and I lived there for four years as a dancer and a model and a spokesperson. And I ended up making more money than my parents combined. I was very, very proud of myself. I also did some backpacking around Thailand and Bali and China. Beautiful. Had a great time. Yeah. Uh, that's where I actually met some of my first Australian friends, actually. So for any reason, if Kendra is listening to this from Sydney, I love you, sister. <laughs> she um, probably is. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. So yeah, then back to back to uh, the States. And that's sort of when things got a little rough. I that's when I first realized I had I guess you call them daddy issues, where I was seeking the love I never received from my dad with my first husband, tall, dark and handsome multimillionaire. I'm like, I've, I've done it. I've arrived. This will be perfect. And yet there was quite a role he wanted me in. And it was I was very much a people pleaser. So initially we were a great fit, but then as I grew spiritually, it was no longer a fit. Um, and so that relationship ended. Second husband was when my mom was dying of cancer. And while I'd like to say I grew from the first relationship, I actually grew a little more jaded, you know, a little more masculine, heart closed, didn't want to feel the pain of my mom's death. I thought a husband and a baby, and I'll make this happen, you know, very, you know, pushing masculine energy. And so that lasted about a year and that, that relationship failed too. And the only one in common was me. And so I'm like, okay, it's time to, time to do the work. And I, and I grew a lot. I forgave myself. I forgave my ex-husbands. Um, but what I didn't see coming was that my second husband would not take the news very well, that I broke my word to him you know, after a year of marriage, I divorced him and that he didn't like looking bad that from his point of view, I humiliated him. I left him in front of everybody. So oh. it turned into a 12 year custody battle. Wow. Yeah. And I lost all my assets, my money, my house, my savings went into about a quarter of a million legal debt. And, uh, and in the end, even my son turned against me for a period of time family turned against me. It was, it was one of those worst moments. Like you, it would be easier if I was dead because then I wouldn't have to deal with it, but I had to get through this somehow. So I decided it would, I decided it was the best thing that ever happened to me because here's the deal. I was such a people pleaser. All my worth was based on my accomplishments. You know, I'm a cum laude graduate of a Ivy league school. I, I now have six books since the, the bio, I need to update the bio. So yep. <laughs> Right, So lots of accomplishments and lots of achievements, but that's where I had misunderstood my worth was. No, those are just my accomplishments. They come and go. My worth is inherent and no one can ever take that away from me, but I didn't know that yet. So the deep inner work I did when I quote unquote lost it all was to find myself 
And so no regrets at all. And I consider my ex to be my greatest spiritual teacher because in the face of anything, I learned how to keep my heart open. I learned how to keep moving forward, to forgive, to shine, to no longer seek approval. I mean, I hope you like me, but if you don't, I'm going to live. And in the past, I would have really been up all night thinking, oh, what did I say wrong? Um, I used to really spin a lot. So it's been a beautiful journey of intimacy. Uh, and then various things happened, like I uh, coached Lisa Gibbons through Dancing with the Stars. Yes. So I had some moments where some celebrities said, oh, can I can I have your help coaching? And I really think it was the universe saying, keep going. You're going in the right direction. Yeah. Uh, and now the business is thriving and there's a new dating app that will be coming out. There's all Ooh. sorts of great digital uh, memberships for people to do the work. As I said, more books, more television, maybe even a TV show in the, I'm in the running. I'm in the running for a show coming up. So it's amazing when you do the work, you don't give up on yourself and you don't get bitter against men or bitter against God. Um, and you really find that feminine soft strength on the inside, uh, the, the magic that can happen. You were just, you know, what you've just shared with our viewers and our readers, so, so powerful. And you've just had this beautiful aura that is oozing from within. And I think, you know, one of the biggest messages that I got from what you just shared there is not to stay angry at self, not to stay angry with the world, but do the work on yourself, spend that time with yourself, get to know yourself. And is it sort of flowing around what we call here self love? Is that in essence, what you're sort of moving towards is really focusing on loving yourself first before others yes. can? Yeah. Yes. Um, in my my dating app that's coming out, it's called Heart Mates, Become the One to Find the One. Yes. Because I had it very backwards. <laughs> I was like, find the one and then you're enough. <laughs> and that is <laughs> not the truth at all. But this idea of self-love, I think we often misunderstand it. I think we think that we have to turn all of our hot mess wobbly parts into perfect parts, and then I can love myself. And it, for me, it's been quite the opposite. It's mm -hmm. been, okay, I'm a badass where I'm a badass. I'm masterful where I'm masterful, and I own it, and I don't apologize. And, not but, and there are parts of me that get scared, that are in the fetal position, that want a hot bubble bath, a tequila shot, and a bag of chips for dinner. <laughs> with you, <all> with you. <laughs> There's a part of me that doubts myself, thinks I'm crazy, you know, all those, like I have her as well. Mm. And in the past, I used to push her away, hit her with a two by four, shove her in the closet. Don't let anybody know that I'm not perfect. And when I started to cultivate that relationship with her, it never worked when I went in with an agenda. Oh, I'll be nice to you if you'll change. I'll be nice to you if you just look different because I don't know how to deal with you. It's like the evil stepchild or something. Like I didn't want anyone to know. <laughs> and the, the true awakening came where I was willing to sit with my hot mess, wobbly parts for eternity, if that's how long it took. Yeah. I just let go, let go of the fixing, the changing. And I just was more about compassion, acknowledgement, validation. Even if that part of me never, ever, ever changed, could I still love her? And when it didn't happen in one sitting or one meditation or one journal uh, episode, it, you know, it cultivated over time. And yet I got there and I realized there's a lot of little Alanas in there who need that unconditional love. And every time I find another one, ashamed, scared, sad, mad, cranky, whoever she is, the more I bring them home, the more I have this um, radiance and this unapologetic courage um, and also like a humility. Like, I don't think I'm better than anyone else because I've faced some pretty dark places. And, uh, and so I, people are all doing their best right now, you know? Yeah. I gave up trying to get rid of half of myself years ago and mm -hmm. beating up on myself and, you know, letting go of control is such a big deal. It's such yeah. a big thing about, you know, expecting other people to live according to how you think they should live or expecting yourself to live how other people think you should live. And, yeah. you know... I've, I've just accepted and I love your thoughts on this, Alana, that some people are going to love me, some people are not going to love me, and that's okay. As long as yeah. I can live with myself, I accept myself, and I can just be who I know I was born to be, I think that's all, that's enough for me. Yeah. Um, would you agree with that or do you have a spin on that or can expand on that? 
Yeah. The, the, at the end of the day, if you can see life as a bell curve, there's yeah. going to be some at the beginning who think you're the devil. Yes. And there's going to be the, the ones in the middle that think you're not so bad. And then the ones at the top who think you're like a goddess and you're not the devil and you're not the goddess. You're definitely somewhere in between. But I suppose we all have our, our devilish ways, <laughs> and our, <laughs> our, our uh, goddess ways, right? So if we can be, you know what? Thank you. I remember very distinctly uh, being in court uh, and my son was on the line. They wanted to take him away from me. They were trying, because I'm an intimacy expert, they were trying to say to the judge, oh, she's a prostitute. Like they were just hitting below the belt everywhere you could think. Oh, she doesn't have a PhD. She's not a doctor. She's some coach. She's probably a narcissist. Like they were just cruel. But back then I hadn't done all this inner work. So I would justify and I would prove and I would say, no, I, I really am good enough. And they're like, oh, she's probably crazy. No, I'm not crazy. But these days I've come to love all my darkness as much as my light that now, I mean, it would probably be really funny if in court they said, yeah, I think she's a prostitute. And I said, oh, haven't got some from the wifey at home. Are you looking for some? Would you like to come over tonight? I probably would have, <laughs> I would have like, you know, screwed with them a bit rather than taking it so personally. So I am, we're all a little crazy. We're all a little wobbly. We're all a little dark. We're all divinity. We're all everything. And so, yeah, at the end of the day, I can't make everybody like me. And that's not even scientifically probable. So we basically hang out with the ones that do care about us, do value us, do cherish us, have patience with us. But in my opinion, because everything's science, you can't manifest that on the outside until you're first vibrating at that, behaving like that on the inside. So it's always become the one first, always forgive yourself first, always have compassion for yourself first, appreciate yourself first. And then that vibration will arise uh, on the outside. And if they don't appreciate you for you, I have my little crazy Aikido move that I do with people's judgments. I tell my clients, if they're just a hot mess and they're being really mean to you, like, Hoi-yo! and you just take it, Hoi -yo! you just Hoi -yo! go to Hoi -yo! I feel like I'm like Bruce Lee or something. Like, I don't have to take it on. Thanks for sharing, but I don't need to resist because then it'll stick. What you resist persists. But if you really can be in allowance, even of cruelty, and just Hoi -yo! let it go by, uh, you can stay in your center. But I, if you get on my email list, I do these weekly inspirations. And just last week, it was a video and I was crying for the whole five minutes of it because I had been set up by a matchmaker and it was somebody quite wealthy and, and established and what have you. And I was getting kind of excited. And uh, we had a great first date on Zoom, I thought. And I was totally myself, completely honest, whatever. And he's like, yeah, this was great. Let's definitely have a glass of wine next week. Super. So normally you'd think they would text once or twice during the week or something, yeah. nothing until four o'clock, the day of the seven o'clock glass of wine. And, and, uh, and he, he calls and he says, well, um, I, uh, this is not going to work. And he went through a three point presentation of why I'm not good enough. <laughs> I just wanted to say F right off, but really? I didn't because then he would have won then I would have got pissed off and then he would have won. I was not going to let his opinion of me determine my worth. Hell no. So I was breathing and breathing and breathing. And at the end, I said something like, thank you for your opinion. I am extraordinary. And if you don't, can't notice, that's totally fine. And I wish you well on your relationship journey. I hung up the phone. I deleted him out of my phone, but then I just broke into tears. Oh, my heart open. It stings. It stings. But within a five minute process, I got myself back to center. I went into that heart space where little Alana really felt like he was a meanie and she had every right to have her heart feel hurt. It was an owie. And I wasn't going to like overstep that or put sprinkles on top of the ice cream cone of shit. Like I say, no, I held her. I let her cry. I, I dove right into the fire. I felt it all. And then in five minutes I was done and I was better. And the old me would have uh, re reacted on the phone, probably been a bitch right back to him, um, would have said I was fine when I wasn't, and it would have lingered for weeks and weeks, keeping me up at yes. three days. But I did, and I dove right into the fire like a brave badass and found my little Alana, and I held her tight. And uh, yeah, and now I'm better. So This is pure gold. So for those who really don't know what you do, Alana, can you share with us how you actually help people attract an open-hearted, ideal relationship? And it's perfect what you just said. 
Yes. Well, you must be open-hearted yourself if you're going to attract an open-hearted relationship. So you'll want to have to have a look at who have you not forgiven yet. It's probably yourself <laughs> um, and another, <laughs> an aspect of yourself. You can look for what the gift is. There's no way we can learn forgiveness if we haven't been betrayed. There's no way we can have uh, courage or strength if we haven't at times felt weak or hidden. Uh, we can't, if, we're, if, if we want to have this unapologetic way of being, we probably have started feeling ashamed of who we are. We're here to evolve. So if you could look at these challenges and obstacles, not just cognitive analysis, but like really feel, really, really feel and go in there to the dark and do the integration processing work that I do with my clients with different, you know, processes I've been trained in, quantum psychology, spiritual, spiritual technology, like the real brain quantum field, like the real lasting stuff, not just a good yes. attitude and 10 more affirmations. Exactly. 10 affirmations are fine, but that's not lasting change. That's just improvement. So you do the really deep inner work. You'll actually become the embodiment of what that failed relationship was meant to teach you. Not just, I'm, I'm more courageous. No, I am courage herself. I am not just a little more uh, soft. No, I am, I am softness herself, right? Like there's a, an embodiment of capacity, of energy that you become when you really do this deep inner work that is measured a scientific vibration, like the company HeartMath, can, uh, you can literally measure the coher coherence of your heart. You put this little thing in your ear and it hooks up to your heart and you can see how coherent you are, which means, are you in the measurable vibration of, of appreciation, kindness, and care, or are you just thinking about it? Because if you just think about it, the little meter doesn't change. You must feel it. Yes. You can't think your way into kindness. You have to feel it. Yes. And so if your heart is closed, you can't feel. And then so you, that's the fakey fake people who, who do the spiritual bypass and they actually don't feel any different. They don't feel safe to be around. They're not like this vortex because they're operating from the chin up. You've got to be willing to do the deep inner heart work, integrate that into a true feeling of vibration, which nobody can take away, by the way. It's yours, and it will vibrationally attract a, an ideal partner, a match, who isn't perfect, nor are you, but I love what Dr. Barbara Marks Hubbard taught me before she passed last year. Um, I was saying to her, Dr. Barbara, I can have oneness with the divine. I can have oneness with little Alana. I've done my inner work, but hell if I can find the dude. Like, where's the dude? <laughs> <laughs> and so she's like, my sweet, you are still stuck in soulmate relationship. You haven't moved yet into wholemate relationship. And so one of the things I love it's about beautiful. my brand is that I'm vulnerable. So I'll always tell the truth. And so here's what I want the listeners or viewers to know. Soulmates tend to face each other, attracting a lot of chemistry with, you know, shadows attract shadows, but you kind of forget about the rest of the world. Maybe you stop going to the gym, hanging out with your kids, whatever. It's just the two of you. But when you move into wholemate relationship, you've done enough of your inner shadow work that you stand beside each other, facing out towards the horizon. Each of you wind in each other's wings here for humanity, because the planet kind of needs some help right now, um, that this is the more mature, lasting, sustainable relationship. So that's what happens when you have a heart open uh, relationship. You, you learn to be a whole mate lover and stand beside your mate and both help each other be better versions of itself, like ignite something in you that only the two of you can ignite, but it's for yourself, for each other and for all. That is just spectacular. It's just full of just wisdom and gold, what you're sharing here. And I hope that people are really taking note, taking notes. And I'll obviously at the end, uh, ask you where we can find out more. Alana, sure. you've written a book called When Mum is Happy, Everybody's Happy. The Missing... <laughs> The Missing Handbook to Motherhood, Regain Your Sanity, Release Guilt and Restore Your Deliciousness. Tell us about that and what motivated you to write that specific book. Oh, that's so great. Thank you. I, uh, this book is really about filling up your tank. We've all heard about putting your oxygen mask on first. And what inspired me to write this, um, while it's been updated several times over the years, was when I lost my mom. And there I was, a single motherless mom, and I only got to see my son half the time since he was one years old. And I was determined not to be a cranky, 
victim by the time he came back that I would use my time when it was just me to fill up my tank so I could be playful and patient and present with him. And so I was, I think, a really great mom. We would not just have dinner, but we would build a fort in the driveway and we would eat with our fingers and paint ourselves like Cirque du Soleil dancers. Like we were so self-expressed. We would dress up in costumes to go to the fair, even if it wasn't Halloween, like just so fun. And I remember my son teaching me. I remember one day at the end of the driveway, it was time to go to preschool and he was standing at the end of the driveway looking and I'm like, car now, sit down. He said, mom, <laughs> mom, I'm looking at the world. And I was oh. like, oh my God. Okay. You're right. You're right. I need to slow the F down. So, um, it was, it's a, it's a lot about filling your tank up. It's a lot about being a dork, not worrying about what people think. It's a lot about awakening that inner child again and allowing your creative juice to flow. And that when you are goofy and you're not worried about what people think and you're messy, it's really sexy actually <laughs> uh, to, to, your, to your husband or if you're single and, and dating. And um, yeah, people have called me a MILF a lot of times. So I take oh, I can say a, why. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I take it as a complete compliment. I would too. <laughs> I, I allow life force energy in me, as me, and through me. I'm willing to heal my heart to open it wide, and um, and I'm willing to be present with my son and not be a victim of my circumstances. I love what you just shared. Then, and so many women, we go through life, you know, on the entrepreneurial journey, looking for love in all the wrong places. We've got this mask on, mm. so afraid of what others will say. I think the fear of criticism is one of the base, well, this one of the six basic fears that stop us in our tracks. What advice would you give to women who probably aren't as open-hearted as you, aren't as beautiful and vivacious as you. I mean, you ooze it, but some people are just all, you know, stuck in their shell. What advice would you give them? Oh my God, you have no idea how, how I used to be. So please, you're very kind with your- Have you got a photo? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm very, very much a people pleaser before. Um, I wouldn't want anyone to go through the custody battle that I went through and have, you know, your family turn against you, your friends turn against you, have to let go of the big house, move into a matchbox, all these external things that I had used as my worth to be taken away from you. But that's how I found my path was there was nothing, not even my son's love for a period of time. We're connected yeah. again now, but even, even my baby wasn't, I didn't know if he'd ever call again, to be quite honest. What if he somehow died when I didn't, when he wasn't with me? Like that would, I mean, I faced the worst of the worst of the worst. And in the face of it all, I did this little sentence and it sounds very simple, but it's actually profound if you really mean it. Even if, this is what I said to myself, even if my son never calls me again, I love and accept myself. Even if everybody opts out of Facebook because they find out I'm some crazy woman with a crazy ex-husband, I love and accept myself. Even if I never get out of debt and I have to work at Starbucks, nothing against Starbucks, I love and accept myself. And so I faced every worst case scenario and I went to her and I sat with her and I said, and I love and accept you no matter what. And slowly but surely uh, it came true. It came true. So my sixth book is called Finding the One is Bullshit. Can I say that on this? Sorry. Of course you um, can. <laughs> okay, I just did. Sorry. <laughs> so Finding the One is Bullshit. Becoming the One is Brilliant and Beautiful. And there's a seven-step process in that book, which actually allows you to rewire yourself from internal worth rather than seeking and grasping on the yes. outside. And it yes. really dissolves that fear of criticism. I'm not going to say that I love to be criticized, um, but it's like, it doesn't take me off center anymore. It doesn't mm -hmm. stop me anymore. And I have bravery and courage, which comes from the heart. And the old Alana only had willpower, pigheadedness, stubbornness, pushing, you know, strength. That's not mm -hmm. courage. The, you can be strong as anything, but, but, if, but inside, if you're still feeling like a mouse and they say you're not good enough, you'll cave. You'll run back yeah. in your little hole. But courage La cour from the heart comes from an open heart and that takes bravery. And my heart, frankly, it's like a stained glass window of a lot of little pieces that I put back together with gold filament. All of us are like that. We've all yep. had our heart broken. Put yep. it back together. It'll be stronger than ever. Open it wide. You're stronger when you're vulnerable than when your heart is closed. 
because when you're open all the way, you can feel that's, it's a scientific coherence. You can measure it, but your prefrontal cortex will turn on. That's where your abstract creative thinking is. So you'll be able to think well on the spot, very discerning, very aware, but also it turns on your intuition and it connects you to non-local intuition, God, the universe, the field, whatever word you want to use. You are in your biggest superpower when you're totally open. Now, it's intense. I'll be honest. You're out of control because you can only act and respond. You can't control anybody. So it's very intense to be completely open and vulnerable, but you're your strongest, wisest, and most intuitive when you're open all the way. And you can handle criticism with the little thingy that we practiced earlier. Um, you learn to live to give, not to get. Like this app that I'm doing, it's a big investment. I'll be honest. It could fail. Oh, I can imagine right? It's like a big risk, but I'm not doing it to succeed. I'm doing it to serve my clients because they're complaining. Oh, it's been like two decades now. They complain that I, I meet somebody great and then things get tough and shit gets real and they ghost me. They give up. They don't sit in the fire with me, Alana, like you do in our processes. They leave. And I'm like, mm, how am I going to create a program so that I can help people become the one to find the one stay in the program for a year. Like even if you meet somebody too bad, so sad, you got to stay in the intimacy training. We're going to learn how to keep our heart open in the face of anything. We're going to learn how to talk through conflict. We're going to start to see conflict as healthy. We're going to learn how to not ghost people. I'm going to give you a freaking script and treat people <laughs> with kindness in this app. Sorry. Like I've got a lot of rules in this app, but I'm really up for helping people treat each other with honor and do the work. So yeah, that's what I would say about the criticism thing. Um, I'm loving what you're, you're saying here. You're so aligned with the millionaires um, message, I guess you'd say, because it, on the you know on the entrepreneurial journey, you know people have this thing that they want the money, they want the success, they want everything that money can buy. And I have a saying: the greatest gift from going on this journey of business and life is not what you get, but who you must become yes. to create the life that you dream of, yeah. because you're not going to get. It's coming from within. You attract. You don't chase success. It can yes. run away from you. Love will run away from you. Yes. You attract. Do you agree with that? Or do you want to expand on that for us? Yeah. Okay. This is brilliant. So to me, I see it's sort of like Neo in the matrix. I've done this work for so long that I see the energy when I do coaching with people. It's kind of weird, but um, the idea that energy comes in us as us and through us. And if we're trying to seek it, it'll, it'll push it away. So yeah. seek the money. It'll push it away. Seek the credibility. It'll push it away. Seek anything. It'll push it away. So we do, we come from giving. We come from giving our genius, giving our gifts, but we also have to have that figure eight come back uh, as well. So it's not go get it to grab it. It's being receptive while giving. So the figure yeah. eight, I give and I'm willing to receive. So you've got to know that you are worthy of receiving money. You've got to actually know exactly. Do you have all the bank accounts set up to receive it? Like, are you actually prepared like for your millions? So there's a lot of coming to have an intimate relationship with money an intimate relationship with the divine, an intimate relationship with your purpose and your genius, an intimate relationship with all your little wobbly parts inside. There's a lot of intimacy to be had. Like I love money and I have lots of money, but I don't go get it. I ask for it. I choose it. And then I just put one foot in front of the other as if it's already done. And I, I mean, I was on today with my staff. I was actually having kind of a wobbly moment. I was a little uh, tired, scared, whatever. And I said, can you just remind me why you believe in me? I just need to be reminded today. And they were so wonderful. They all told me why they did. And a bar none across it, they're like, Alana, you're a warrior. You work so hard. You always walk your talk. You always talk to your own coach. You always put one foot in front of the other. You make mm -hmm. messes every day and clean them up. You fail every day and get back up. They're like, it's just inspiring to be around you. I'm like, really? <laughs> okay, guys, <guess> I forgot. <laughs> so, so it's still about being humble on the journey. But yeah, in as and through, give, but don't get lopsided and give too much and don't you know not be the space to receive your worth as well ask for your worth don't settle um but remember the the core motivation is you are here to give your gifts and it almost it ought to hurt not to give them it's got to hurt more to not give them than the fear of criticism when you actually do the inner work you know, we, we talk about focus on the people, not yourself. And, you know, uh, we, we teach the same sort of stuff as, you know, about being an entrepreneur. We call it soulful serving. 
when nice. you really shift and you open up your heart and you give from the calling and you create an inspirational business or a heart filled business, the money will flow because you're going to be paid in exact proportion to the value you bring other people's yes. business. And so many people have it twisted around where they're just so money intense, money focused. And I think it's really beautiful what you just said then, you know, that are you set up for it? Have you, are you prepared for the money? Because money flows to those who are organized and have an open heart. Yes. And who love money. Like I have these conversations with my clients about money and I said, so who's your money lover? Like it's a persona. And my money lover used to be this dude and his back was to me and he wouldn't look at me. And I was like, well, you're fired because I'm getting a new money goddess then. So now my money goddess, she's like this thousand armed, undulating, sensual, sea anemone yes. goddess thing. And she nourishes me. She takes care of me so I can serve more. We're like homies. So that's my new money <laughs> goddess. <laughs> this is great. This is one of the most fun conversations I've had. I just love your energy. Oh, I love that. You. Your money goddess. I, I know there's uh, people are so wound up about money. You know, I don't know. I don't know what it's like from where you come from, but in Australia, we have what we call the tall poppy syndrome. Oh, Anyone yes. who elevates and gets out there and shares their message or creates a business or creates success. We have this thing in Australia where people cannot wait to cut you down, to pull you back, to criticize you. Uh, and so where I'm going with that is what do you, what is your take on, you know, being surrounded by mentors and a mastermind who can help you in times like that when even the people you love criticize you, laugh at you, say that you're, you know, you're not worth it. What would you uh, say about that? It doesn't just happen in Australia, by the way. Oh, it doesn't <laughs> happen. <laughs> it's everywhere. It's uh, it's everywhere. Um, what I would say is notice where we're focusing our worth. Everything we've been saying about the fear or the criticism or what the tall poppy is or what your parents say or all that, it's all outside in, all of it. Uh, and so just take a real hard look at where are you sourcing your worth? If your worth is outside in, anybody's going to stop you. Tall poppy parents, some, you know, bad write up or whatever. I, I've been practicing being humiliated, ridiculed, told I'm horrible for a very long time. <laughs> You're an expert. I'm, very ex I'm totally an expert at it. There isn't a day where I don't get hate mail. Not a day. There isn't a day where I don't get opted out of my email list. There isn't a day where somebody makes some stupid comment about some video I put up there. But, I'm, but it's like, you're not in the ring, baby. You're not even showing up. You have no right to say what, anything about me. You, you don't have any legs to stand on. So I don't pay attention to that because they're not on my level. Now, if somebody on my level wants to give me constructive criticism, I'll take it in. I'll consider it. Maybe they've got some, something to share there that could make me better. Thank you. But if you're not playing at this level, you don't, get to, you don't get to come into my field because I've decided my worth is inherently on the inside out. I am wiring myself from the inside out. I am pouring and I have a two hour morning practice. I do. It takes me that long to really raise my vibration and love all those little parts and listen to that small, still voice and exercise my body and take care of all my supplements and my menopausal hormone things I'm taking, <laughs> like all that stuff, right? Like I got a two hour window there to get this girl going. And I do it on purpose though, because all day long I'm coming up against rejection, criticism, tall poppy people, mm. and they have their opinion and that's fine. They have every right to their opinion, but I don't have to take it on. And I've done enough inner work to let it go on by. And then when you raise yourself up that high, you become the invitation, the inspiration for those to join you and shine. And if those don't want to join, you bless them. You bless them on their journey, but you don't give them a lot of your attention. You put your attention forward, heart open, serving, hanging out with the other few tall poppies up there. Um, it's lonelier at the top, but yeah. it's, it's richer because there's so much energy coming in you as you through you to serve. You just feel so good that you never gave up. You feel so proud of yourself that you never gave up. And it's a very humble, quiet pride, not an external accomplishments pride. It's like at the end of the day, if I get one little email from somebody and my staff sends them to me all the time, they're my gatekeepers. They put all the hate mail in the trash and they send me the nice stuff. Every Friday I get a nice email, all the nice stuff. And, and I think, wow, this person I never knew on the other side of the planet, I had no clue, read my book, was on the train, decided she was good enough, radiated a little bit more, looked up, met the love of her life. 
Are you serious? Oh. Because I wrote a book? Like well, those little moments keep me going for years, years, one human, one human. And then, I, then I'm reminded in my deep meditation moments, I am that human. We are one. We're all connected. We don't need the millions of Facebook likes. Fine, if that's what happens. My staff is always, you got to write better titles on your YouTube videos. You get more followers. And I'm like, yeah, but I don't care about all the shallow crap. Like, that's not who I am. I just want to give them truth. I want to love yeah. them deeply and give them authentic, vulnerable truth. So, yeah. And, you know, the only reason that, you know, probably that other male comes in, some people just not ready for the truth, not interested in the truth. And so along my journey, I've just learned to focus on what I'm here to do, focus on serving and let the other stuff fall away. Because I think you said it before, we cannot control other people's perceptions, how they view life, how they view you. So just get on with it. And I, you know, I think that is the biggest message. And one of the reasons why so many women hold themselves back is that fear. However, let's move on. In the book, this is going to be a good one. You talk yeah. about mums who yearn for more me time. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and the, how, how they've lost their identity and passion for life. What's one piece of advice you would give to women feeling this way? I think that was how you were feeling, that you'd lost your identity and passion for yeah. life, I beg your pardon. What about other women feeling the same? Yeah. When we're empty, I don't know if it's a point of view, if it's spiritual, if it's emotional, if it's physical, if it's hormonal, or all of it together. <laughs> That's all I right. remember what it's like to not find that happy place inside anymore. And so the very first thing I did was to create space to find, to find her. So I told my son, he was very small. He could read the, the numbers on the clock radio. Uh, and so I said, when it's 700, then you can come in to wake up mommy in the morning because otherwise I'm looking for my patience and kindness. And so you can tell that to a 17 year old or a three year old, but you have to have your healthy boundaries that mommy needs mommy time. And so for the first three mornings, he came in at like four 30 and I was a hot net, like just cranky, cranky lady. So I turned him around, put him back in his room, seven zero zero. He cried second night, same thing. Third, third night, he came in in the morning, seven zero zero mommy. It's seven zero zero. Have you found your patience and kindness? <laughs> I had, I had, and I praised him and he felt like a hero. And really what I did is I got up at six, not seven. And I journaled, I meditated, I masturbated, or some mornings I just kept sleeping. If that's what I needed, but I, I filled up my cup. You know, I took care of me first. I, we call it in my household, fill up your bucket. I need to fill up my bucket. And uh, now that he's older, he's 17 now. If he has like had it, mom's been talking too much or whatever. He's like, mom, I need to fill up my bucket. I'll talk to you later. And so I'm so teaching good. him healthy boundaries too. So um, just remember, you're, if the people only like you, if they can use you, do they really love you? Are they really your mm -hmm. friends? No. No, they're using you and you're letting them. So no victims. We can create healthy boundaries, even if we have to get up an hour earlier, but the family needs to know that mama needs her mama time because when mama's happy, everybody's happy. <laughs> I couldn't agree more, gorgeous. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. goes for animals and all sorts of things. Yes. Use your own time. Now, you also mentioned in the book about the power that comes with learning to ask for help. Another thing that women aren't so good about yeah. What, why do you think learning to ask for help is so important? Well, it's so important because we cannot do it all on our own, says Alana, who has such a humongous <laughs> team and everybody has their little jobs. And I, I mean, I literally can't do it without them. Um, I, I hit a ceiling of how far I could go doing everything myself. And so when I let, started to learn how to let go of control, then I started to empower others, praise others, believe in others, and they want to serve. Like one of my staff members, her husband said she can't quit. She's not allowed because she's really, really nice now that she works for me. <laughs> <laughs> and when she wasn't working for me, she was really cranky because I'm like positive juicy lady or whatever. So, um, so, so yes. Yeah, so we want to remember to, to ask for help. But here's the other thing about asking for help. If the point of view is that you're weak, broken, and wrong, if you ask for help, where are you seeking your worth from? Again, it's accomplishments. Yes. Look how perfect I am. Oh. I did it all myself. <gasps> how tired are you? Well, I'm even more tired. It's like a badge of honor to be so tired. Well, I have adrenal fatigue. Well, I have triple adrenal fatigue. <laughs> like, shut the F up, okay? No, it's not a badge of honor. It's a sign of being a victim and a control freak. And you're not allowing partnership. You're not allowing sisterhood. You're not allowing collaboration. 
cooperation, all these feminine principles you're not allowing. So have a little humility and a little self-worth so that you value yourself from the inside out so that you can be vulnerable. Just like I was today when I had my meeting with my staff, I asked them to remind me why they believe in me. I was vulnerable and I needed their help. I needed to be reminded. And so, so yes, ask for help is a, a sign of wisdom, strength, and you will become a queen. Think about a queen. She doesn't run around like riding the horses and making the bread and like doing the thing with the drawbridge. Like, and she's like, no, she's got to like chill out in her castle, right? She's got to delegate. She's got to like figure out, you know, so that, so all of the villagers and all of the, the whole world thrives because she knows what she knows in her heart. Right back to that heart again, right? The coherence. Do the inner work with your heart because when your heart is healed, and your heart is open, you sense, oh, there's an attack coming from the north, from the castle, right? Like you, you hear your intuition say, oh, something's going on with my kid. They've, they've been a little different. I need to like slow down, maybe take them away for, you know, breakfast this weekend so I can be the space of listening for them. You'll know that in your intuition, or you'll have that feeling of like, mm, it's time for me to not just go to the boot camp. I think I'm ready for an erotic burlesque class. I think I want something that's going to be a little more juicy for my exercise. Like all of this wisdom and knowing is from deep inside and then shared in conversation when you ask for help from your, from your mentors. And one last little example. Yes, just yesterday. I always give like real life examples here on interviews. So just yesterday, I, I used to be a pole dancer. I pole danced for like seven years. I was super strong and it was super hot, but it was also really healing because it was during the court battle. And this was safe sisterhood. No mirrors, no men, just women nourishing each other, believing in one another. And three years ago, I moved away, so I stopped going to class, and I still exercise and do my thing, but there's nothing like women who unconditionally love each other moving, yeah. not even talking. We would know how each other's day was going based on our posture, based on if our hips were tight or really swirling, you know, all of this. So I, I, um, I reached out to my old teacher, and I said on Zoom, can we just do some lessons? Because I really miss it. And I saw her. <gasps> I lost it. I was like, I miss you. I miss this unconditional love. Because even though I do a lot of work, if I'm still a hot mess in front of a guy I'm dating, I'm still a little afraid, like maybe I'm too much or what's he going to think or, you know, or even if I want to be held in a certain amount of time, we got to put out, he'll probably want sex. Like there's just like an after thing that happens in my brain. But when I'm with a sister, I can just lay in her arms, cry like a hot snotty mess. And she just loves me. And she just listens and she doesn't fix me. And I forgot how much I needed that. So we cried, then we moved and I writhed on the floor and she's like, yeah, work through your hips, sister, breathe deeper. And she knew exactly what to say. And by the end of it, oh. I felt like intoxicated with yumminess. It was so good. So I asked for help. I hired my teacher via Zoom. Like that was a brave move when I knew what I needed. So please be willing to be there for each other. We all are here to be together. We, otherwise, we'd each have our own planet, but we don't. We're all stuck together. So <laughs> let's help each other, <laughs> ask for help, receive help, and, and really enjoy that connection. I just love the, uh, the, the truth that you're sharing with our ladies here today. And it's just, you know, really beautiful to see and just owning it. And, you know, so many people try and go this alone, try and be perfect, try and figure it all out which is just impossible. And I just love that you're just showing your vulnerability and being so successful on the one hand, but just being real. This is the whole thing about millionaires, real, raw and relatable women. Okay. Yeah. You have it in spades. And I just want to say thank you so much because I really believe this uh, conversation is going to impact so many women's lives and just you're giving them permission where sometimes they don't give themselves permission. So I want to say thank you for that. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. A couple thank more you. questions. Have you got time? I do. I do. Yes. Thank you. Oh, this is so good. Okay. So you have training that you offer ladies called vulnerability is the new sexy. You share that. It's sexy because one who is vulnerable doesn't need my approval and thus draws me in like a moth to the flame, huh. curious with how they shine so bright, sourcing their truth, breath by courageous breath, inspiration by innovative inspiration. Tell us more about that. Mm. Vulnerability, as I was saying before, is our strongest place. 
Yeah. You can kind of think of yourself like the lady of the lake. Like she has her sword, right? Like don't mess with her. But she's not walking around with her sword in your face. She's not going to have a big shield afraid all the time. She, the sword is down. Her heart is open. And she leads with love. She leads with authenticity. She leads with giving and serving and, and just savoring being a woman, being alive. And yeah, don't mess with her. She's got her sword as well. So it's not like you're a doormat. It's not like you're loopy and out to lunch. You're still very discerning and aware. Um, but yeah, this is, this is the power of vulnerability. And it invites the others to be vulnerable. It invites the truth that um, maybe others wouldn't share. I'm remembering being at the grocery store with my son. And I'm, I really like to make contact. Like if I'm going to be present, I'm 100% there. I don't do it half ass. If I'm not there, I'm like, hang on, I'm not quite there yet. So my son and I are in the line and the grocery store clerk, um, I said, how are you? But I, may, I made it land. Like I was actually listening. Yeah. My mom just died. And I said, wow, how are you? And he, like everything went away. And he told me and he got so seen, safe and heard, understood just in that moment to be so nurtured. And then we left with our, with our groceries and my son said, mom, that happens to you all the time. Everybody tells you everything. And I said, yeah, babe, here's the, here's the magic. I care. I'm not going to judge them. And I'm okay with my vulnerability so I can be okay with theirs. And they smell it. They taste it. They, they sense it's safe to be real. And it makes my whole life magic. I get to go so deep in these little baby snippets or long interviews like this, like all the difference or lovemaking or with a girlfriend or what have you, or even if I'm just being vulnerable with nature. I'm not like, hmm, lovely garden. I like, garden, penetrate me. Have your way with me with your beauty. Like I'm engaged all the time. Um, it makes for a really rich life and a fulfilling life so yeah. that it helps you not be so attached to the results and the, the accomplishments and enjoy them, but not need them to feel so full on the inside because you can really have these, these beautiful connected moments your, your, your whole day, every day. I can see why so many people want your time. You know, you're a beautiful, special human being. And I have no doubt you impact so many lives in so many incredible ways you may never even hear about. And I want you to know how impactful this conversation has been. I've got one last question because I know you're busy. Alana, what specifically would you love to be known and remembered for? Oh, what a beautiful question. Yeah, that I made people feel safe seen, understood, and loved for every part of them, which means like their amazing masterful genius, as well as their wobbly parts that I, I loved them all equally. And they felt that love equally. Yeah. I can feel the love oozing from within. You're a beautiful <laughs> lady. Al Alana, I just want to say thank you so much. This has been a beautiful conversation. I yeah. so appreciate you and you're an integral part of the Millionaires Magazine and the Millionaires Movement. And I know this is not the last conversation that you and I will have. Oh, I hope not. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's keep chatting. <laughs> oh, let's do that. I'm going to, uh, now where can our, our, our ladies find more about you? Where's the best place to send them? Yeah, please. My website is my name, alanapratt.com. So A-L-L-A-N-A-P-R-A-T-T.com. There's a wonderful quiz about an intimacy blind spot. It's an assessment. And a lot of the ladies listening are very, very bright. And of course, if you could figure it out yourself, you would have. Same with me, right? But this is about asking for help, where there I have my coach to show my blind spots. This quiz will show you where your blind spot is. You, you think it's this, but really it's something deeper. And then when you know, sometimes I'll admit the truth first pisses you off and then it sets you free. You'll be like, oh, exactly. <laughs> but at least that way you can take your power back. You can do the work and you can get the results that you're looking for. So that's a great place for people to start. Thank you so much, gorgeous lady. And I look forward to our next conversation that I know won't be too far in the distant future. Um, and you have a beautiful afternoon. And again, thank you from my heart, Alana. I so appreciate it. Oh, it's really been such a pleasure. You're just divine. And as soon as we get to travel again. Get uh, down on the girlfriend. Yes, absolutely. I'll be there. I'll be there. <laughs> All right, lovely lady. You have a fabulous afternoon. Thank Bye you. for now. Bye.